Hi guys, welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to be going into a bit more technical detail. Um, I've covered in a previous video uh, introduction to Snowflake uh, for beginners around the Snowflake architecture and if you want to see that you can click on the pop-up banner just over here. And um, in this video I'm going to talk to you about micropartitions and how Snowflake stores data on disk and also about clustering, so how data when it's loaded into Snowflake how that data is structured and ordered, and then if you get performance problems, what steps you need to take then in order to improve your performance by analyzing the clustering key, by just changing the, the size of your virtual warehouses, or actually getting into the detail and changing the clustering key yourself. So, so again, if you find uh, these videos useful and valuable, I'd really appreciate it if you like and subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to be notified because I'm releasing new videos every week. Okay guys, so micropartitioning and clustering in Snowflake. So what is micropartitioning? Well, if you guys are new to that concept, it might be worthwhile checking out my Snowflake architecture for beginners video. If you click the pop-out banner at the top of the screen, that will be, give you a really good sense of what micropartitioning is and the architecture as a whole and how that all fits together. So Snowflake stores data in small blocks of data called micropartitions, and they're effectively small blocks of storage which sit on the underlying cloud provider's data store. So that could be AWS S3, Google's cloud data storage, or Azure Blob. As data lands into Snowflake, a few key things happen which are completely transparent to you as the user. It's these operations which create the solid foundation, which in turn enables light and fast query performance. You can break those operations down roughly as follows. So the first thing that happens is the data is divided up and mapped into micropartitions using the ordering of the data as it's loaded into Snowflake. Secondly, the data is compressed natively within Snowflake. And then there's metadata, which is captured and stored. So then Snowflake knows exactly where that data then resides on, on storage. So what are the benefits of micropartition? Where bear, bear in mind that given the small size of these partitions, for very large tables, we'll be talking millions and millions of these micropartitions. But this granularity introduces additional flexibility, which allows for finer grain query pruning, and we'll get into that in a second. But imagine having a transactional table with 10 years of sales history, but you only want to look at just yesterday's sales. So there's obviously, obviously a real massive benefit of targeting just the data you need rather than scanning the entire table to return just yesterday's data, such a small proportion. You can compare this to when you look for information in a book. So you could search through all the pages at random trying to attempt what you're looking for, or you could use the index. And that would be a much more efficient way to find what you need. And that's very similar to what's happening here with Snowflake's metadata about where the data resides on what micro partitions to avoid you scanning the entire 10 years of sales history. So what happens with semi-structured data and does that look any different? Well, the great thing is with Snowflake, the same approach does largely hold true for semi-structured data. Snowflake will attempt to convert the paths of a, of a JSON data set, for example, within the data into columns behind the scenes. it will try to do it in opportunic fashion to support optimization on, on queries further down the line. So by doing this, Snowflake can also capture the metadata on those sub columns in the same way that it does for regular structured data and then everything works the same way from a query optimization perspective. And if the user writes a query then which targets a sub path in the JSON data as an example, this will be optimized in exactly the same way as a regular column. So let's move on to talk a little bit about clustering. So micro partitions are arranged using the clustering key. So that's automatically decided by Snowflake. And again, we mentioned it earlier, that's based upon the order that the data is loaded. That concept known as data clustering is defined automatically as data is loaded into Snowflake and it works just fine for most of the time. However, when your table grows to be very large, over one terabytes as a rule of thumb, or large amounts of DML have been applied to the table, kind of restructuring it and reorganizing the data and spreading it more widely across uh, across the storage, the cloud storage area. This will cause natural degradation of the natural clustering over time. So and that ultimately impacts you as the user from a query performance standpoint. So it's really important to have an effective clustering key, which allows a query to scan less micropartitions, return less data into the cache, 
and ultimately reduce latency to the user application who submitted the query. When should you change the clustering key? So other than the table being very large, one of the other determinant factors of when you should consider changing your clustering key is when the usage pattern against your data is different to the order the data is loaded. So let me give you an example. Imagine that you have a very large transactional table which contains order information, and that data is lo loaded into Snowflake by order date. So everything will be clustered in that, in that order of order date. Let's say like 80, 90 percent of your queries against that table uh, all query the table using order ID. So in this particular instance, you'll get better performance by setting a multi-column clustering key on order date and order ID columns. If you're finding these uh, videos useful and you want to get into the detail, then I would really recommend having a look at my Snowflake Expert Bootcamp course. There's a link in the pop-up banner to have a look at a, a webinar I ran quite recently on this, which gives you a bit more detail behind it. But this course that I'm going to run from eight weeks starting in mid-October isn't about theory, it's about taking all the capabilities of Snowflake and going taking a deep dive really into how you package those up to address common real-world challenges using my experience in the field, helping clients every day. So it's a really quite a unique offering and um, places are selling out really fast. So if you're interested, you can drop me an email on the link below or get in touch via the mechanisms. And again, if you find this YouTube channel uh, useful and you're getting information, good information from it, I'd really like you to uh, subscribe, click the like button and the bell icon to get notified every time I upload videos because there's new videos coming every week. OK, let's move on to talk about query pruning, which we mentioned a bit earlier. So this essentially is the process of narrowing down a query to only read what's absolutely necessary to satisfy the query. The efficiency of the pruning can be observed by comparing partition scanned versus partition total statistics in the table scan operators within the query profile. So if you drill down into your uh, query history within the web UI in Snowflake, you can click on the query ID. This will bring up some information, um, statistical information, and show you the, the query plan. I give you some breakdown of stats. So one of those stats is around partition pruning, and it tells you how many uh, partitions that, that your actual query scanned against the total number of partitions available for that data set. The wider the gap between the number of partitions scanned to the total partitions available, the better. The less partitions you're scanning, the less data you need to read, and the quicker the query will, will return because avoiding reading unnecessary partitions is ultimately the, the bottom line and the name of the game here. If those numbers were much closer together, then that would tell you that pruning isn't really helping your query, in which case for very large tables, you could look at changing the clustering key. For smaller tables, you could look to reorganize your query to include a filter, which introduces the existing clustering key into the mix. And also, when you look at your query plan, if a filter operator exists just above the table scan, which removes a significant number of records, then this could be an indication that restructuring your query might be looking uh, worth looking into. And um, if you're interested in that, drop me uh, a message in the comments below because I might um, do another session around how to read the query plans and um, interpret it for your own needs as well. So let me know if that's uh, of interest to you guys. Um, I'm also going to talk about cluster and depth very briefly. So cluster and depth or table provides a value which is always one or greater for any populated table. It's actually zero for an empty table because no data exists. But this tells you how many micro partitions contain data from a particular column or columns in a table. The closer the number is to one, the better the data is clustered. That means all the data from a particular column is clustered together. Uh, this means that a query has to be less micro partitions for a particular column to satisfy a query. So several factors can impact the cluster in depth. As DML operations are performed over time on the table, data will become more spread out on disk and therefore it'll be arranged over more micro partitions. There's some handy system functions that um, ship with Snowflake that can help you assess how well clustered the table is. So the clustering information function returns the cluster in depth as part of its JSON result set amongst a number of other things. And if you're interested in that, you can look on the, uh, the Snowflake documentation itself. Alternatively, you could use the cluster in depth function, which just returns the depth of the table functions. You provide a table name along with optionally one or several columns. The function will return how well clustered the table is based upon the columns you provide when you call the function. 
just be aware that if you don't specify any columns, when you call those functions, the existing clustering key is used by default. So in summary then, make sure you understand how Snowflake stores data into micropartitions. Have an understanding about why clustering is important and the impact query pruning has on query performance. Try to design your queries to leverage those elements. For very large tables where performance starts to degrade, review the clustering depth using some of the functions I mentioned and consider review reviewing the clustering key used. For those tables which are subject to regular DML operations, consider reclustering the data if the table performance becomes a concern. So you can actually reorganize and recluster the data based upon the existing clustering key if their performance starts to degrade for those tables which are subject to DML operations. I'd just like to point you in the direction of some resources that you might find useful as well. I've got a Udemy course which has helped over 2,000 students so far prepare for the Snow Pro course certified exam. There's a link in the comments. By all means, follow and connect me on LinkedIn where I'm posting regularly about Snowflake and content, um, value, valuable content that I'm putting onto YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you find these, these, these videos useful. Finally, I've got a new book coming soon. So early next year, there'll be a new book coming out for, around building solutions with Snowflake where I package up my knowledge and real, uh, real world experience and, uh, and give you the information about how you can apply that uh, in, your own, in your own environments.